Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Robin with the Ramsey County Historical Society. And again, thank you for coming out to this special presentation here at the Eastside Freedom Library. We are so happy to have a sponsorship with the Eastside Freedom Library. The partnership with them means a lot to us. We have monthly programs here, and we work on a lot of other special events with them. So. Again, I want to thank Peter and Clarence and Carla and the entire group here at the Eastside Freedom Library for helping out and making these such a wonderful program series for us. We also do programs at other venues throughout St. Paul and Ramsey County. Next Thursday, no, Thursday after next Thursday, February 20th, we'll be having a very special event up at the Roseville Library where we'll be having a panel presentation about three important St. Paul Jewish writers, William Hoffman, Norman Katkoff, and Max Schulman, who wrote a number of novels, as well as film scripts, TV scripts, and so members of their family will be coming. We'll be having some historians talk about their lives, and it'll be a really fun presentation with readings from their books, anecdotes from the families, and some video clips of some of the TV um, programs, including the uh, W. Gillis series. Some of you may remember that series. So that would be fun. On March 5th, back here at the Eastside Freedom Library, Kate Roberts and Michelle Whitty will be coming back with She Voted Her Fight, Our Right, talking about the new exhibition up at the Minnesota Historical Society. The, our group, the Ramsey County Historical Society, will also be having an exhibition on suffrage in August 18th. That exhibition will be opening up at the Landmark Center in downtown St. Paul. So in the back of the room by the books, there are a number of flyers with all of our upcoming programs, so you can check online at www.rchs.com. And I also want to thank Sue from Subtext for coming tonight with books for sale. So there are copies of Trans-Pacific Racism in the back of the book. You may certainly buy one and have, I'm sure you each would be happy to have it signed uh, for you after the program. So I'm going to introduce Peter now and he'll come up and say a few words and then we'll go into the program. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Robin. So we're, we're thrilled to be able to partner with the Ramsey County Historical Society uh, doing a series called History Revealed. Um, tonight is a very special treat for me and for us. Um, it's wonderful to have Yuichi Onishi here, um, who many years ago was a student of mine uh, at McAllister College um, before he really plunged into history full time. And uh, Yuichi is also on our board uh, here at the Eastside Freedom Library. Um, we are uh, a nonprofit. Some of you, I think, I see new faces are here for the first time. Um, we're trying to work at the intersection of immigration history and labor history, the intersection of issues of racism, sexism, economic injustice, and what we can do. Um, particularly using history to inform ourselves to be more effective in making a better world. Um, after the last week, um, it's good for us to be together tonight and to be thinking about what we can do to make a better world. Um, so you each has recently released uh, this new book, Trans-Pacific Correspondence, uh, dispatches from Japan's Black Studies. Um, we won't mention how expensive it is, but you can read it for free here at the Eastside Freedom Library. Um, it's not his fault, as we know, in a capitalist uh, society, workers don't control um, the prices of the commodities that they produce. Um, I do want to mention in that vein that uh, we are starting this coming Saturday uh, or Saturday the 15th, uh, a once a month reading group that will be reading volume one of Marx's Capital. Um, and uh, we're also starting this month a reading group uh, focused on reparations uh, in partnership with Black Lives Matter and the Green Party. So there are lots of things that you can get involved with here, come to events here, um, and I'm just so really pleased to have you each here. So. 
You each of you ready? Yes, I'm. <laughs> Great. Thank you. All right, man. All yours. Well, thank you all um, for coming. Um, my name is Yuichiro Alishi. Um, I also teach um, at the University of Minnesota in two units, African American and African Studies, and also Asian American Studies. Um, like Peter mentioned, that I was a student also at McAllister and went on to do graduate work at the U and, and then taught elsewhere, but specifically in New York. And I might, I might talk about that a little bit, um, or read about it. Um, what what that experience meant meant for me and, and for the book. Um, I want to thank um, Robin Ramsey Historical Society, um, the Ramsey County Historical Society. I'm sorry, Eastside Freedom Library for giving a new life uh, to this book. It was published in 2013, um, so it's been it's been now seven years, and I'm really <laughs> honored that. I have a, a new life and I get to share this book. Um, and also want to thank all the staff members uh, here. Carla always you know, films the talks and events, plans, and, and also, um, of course, Peter. Um, what I want to do, and I want to thank you all for coming, but I want to, I want to accomplish three things. Um, and I want to spend about 30 minutes um, accomplishing those three things. Um, first, I want to um, just describe what this book is about, the contents. Um, and then I want to share with you um, how, how it all started, the genesis of this book. And I, I get that a lot. Like, how did, how did you get so interested in, in African American studies and as an Asian person? Um, how did you pick this topic? So I wanted to kind of talk. There are many ways to explain to me how, how it all started, but I don't want to. Can you pick pick my teaching experience as a, as a as a window into that? And then the third, um, maybe I want to touch on um, the state of Afro Asian solidarity now today, um, not just in Asia, Black Lives Matter, but in a world in which we live, um, you know, in the context of the deportation regime to just ascendant and triumphant really vulgar system of, of um, racial violence and domination. And I'm so sorry, if you see blood in my mouth, don't worry. I have this huge cut right now on my tongue. And it's just, um, I bit my tongue while I was teaching earlier. I don't want to talk about this. I know it's the like Facebook Live. <laughs> but I, I paste it, and my students saw blood in my mouth, and they're worried. And But it's it's... It's it's just it's just the way it is. <laughs> okay, so this just started with um, what what this book is about. Um, um, and so it's called Trans Pacific Anti Racism, um, and the subtitle is Afro Asian Solidarity in Twentieth Century Black America, Japan, and Okinawa. Um, and explores various forms of Afro-Asian solidarity that cropped up throughout the 20th century in three different places, Black America, um, Japan, and Okinawa. And the key term, the appellation, the Afro-Asia, that I pick up, um, I don't really romanticize it um, more. I really wanted to really approach this concept of Afro-Asia as, as a certain kind of domain domain that was shaped by multiple currents of resistance. And specifically, these resistance, the currents of resistance are anti-imperialist, anti-colonial, of course anti-racist, but also anti-war. And these currents of resistance became raw materials um, out of which various participants of social movements in those three places um, negotiated and then forged solidarity. Um, the, one of the key takeaways of this book, and it's something that I think I still believe in, and why many of you are here for many reasons, I think is that social movements, um, big or small, short-lived or enduring, um, then and now, um, I, I really think it's just social movements are powerful, powerful, powerful wellspring of, of uh, not just ideas, aspirations, um, but social relations. Um, 
And I wanted to read you um, this quote um, by um, Robin, and many of you heard of him, but Robin D.G. Kelly, one of the finest Centaurian black intellectuals of our time. And he wrote this book called Freedom Dreams. And this quote, as I was writing this book and writing the dissertation, really became a kind of like a marker for me to remind myself of why, why I wrote this book and why I dug in, into the people, the individuals, constituents of social movements that helped to, you know, ferment and shape these currents of resistance that are anti-imperialist, anti-colonial, anti-war, and anti-racist. And the quote goes like this. In a poetics of struggle um, and lived experience, in the utterances of ordinary folk, in the cultural products of social movements, in the reflections of activists, we discover many different cognitive maps of the future, of the world not yet born. And what I found in, in struggles that I try to document, um, Afro-Asian solidarity struggles, I really did find these cognitive maps of the future, the world not yet born. And I really come to realize that these activists were sort of um, rehearsing the future as though it's already here in the present, whatever present that they occupy. And to me, I wanted to um, kind of lift that up. Um, in my case study really was Afro-Asian solidarity. So what I want to do is to kind of tell you um, that the, uh, and then maybe at the end of describing the context, and I'll tell you what my thesis is. You gotta have a thesis when you write a book. But <laughs> <laughs> so there are two parts to this book, and it spans the 20th century. Um, the first two parts, or chapters rather, um, talk about African-American radical intellectuals um, during the interwar period, First World War, period and in interwar 30s, um, and how they um, discovered Japan um, and forged solidarity with Japan, not in practice but through political imagination, to articulate demands for black liberation. And in the second two chapters, shift the focus on to Japan and Okinawa and looks at, um, the second part looks at Japanese and Okinawan, did you read? Activists and intellectuals, engagement with black liberation. So let me start with, with the first part. Um, they, these intellectuals, black intellectuals, they are really fine writers, um, and you are poets, they're not just scholars and activists. And they're prolific. They published a lot in their own magazines and newspapers. And of course, there are activists on the ground shaping the movement. So I'm thinking about maybe you may have heard of some of these black intellectual activists and books here at East Side Freedom Library. They carry them all. A. Philip Randolph, um, Chandler Owen. These are socialists who edited the, the magazine called The Messenger. You may not have heard of him, but Hubert Harrison, he was from the Caribbean. I believe he's from, I don't want to say it because I might be wrong, but one of the, St. Croix, no? Dominica. Like, hmm? Dominica. Dominica? He's from the one of the Dutch colony. Um, Hubert Harrison, migrant, Caribbean migrant in New York City, self-taught, sort of organic intellectual, just phenomenal writer who wrote a lot. And but meanwhile, he would do this soapbox oratory on the streets of Harlem and would teach the masses about world affairs. And um, anyway, so Hubert Harrison, in many ways, also sort of a mentor of some of the greatest, you know, great black intellectual activists like A. Philip Randolph regarded Hubert Harrison as the father of Harlem radicalism. So I look at these black intellectuals, and Du Bois as well, and how they use Japan and its defiance against the sort of global white supremacy. And some of you may know a little bit about history, but Japan was emerging as this kind of quite powerful world sort of an entity and force contesting the international system 
dominated by, by Anglo-American powers. And during the World War I and aftermath, during the Paris Peace Conference, Japan sort of was trying to get into the League of Nations in, as an equal of any, but recognized that the whole system was stacked up against them, against, the, against Japan. So introduced this clause called racial equality clause. That Japan should be treated as the same as white polities. And this, this discourse of racial equality sort of caused a trigger among black intellectual activists, and they took it. And, and what's interesting about this is that they basically kind of rallied behind Japan. And what's interesting about, for me, was that these black intellectual activists were left intellectual activists. They're Marxist. They're thoroughly aware of the fact that Japan was no champion of darker racism. I mean, Japan was an aggressive colonizer in Asia and in imperialist. I mean, through and through, Japan was no friend of black America. But they rallied behind Japan. In many ways, to contest the Wilsonian democracy, this idea of, the, you know, what is it, to, to war to save, or save democracy. And, yeah, what is it? No yeah. And meanwhile, Wilsonian was the one, the administration was the one that was sort of, sort of, you know, enabling colonialism the world over, re-entrenchment of Jim Crow racial order at home. So black intellectual activists sort of, even though they knew Japan was no friend, at the level of discourse, they used Japan's racial equality clause as a way to contest how the world affairs is organized, how domestic racial affairs were shaped. And what I found so interesting about them is that they're so race conscious and class conscious at the same time, these black intellectual activists. They oscillated. And they're strategic in a way they kind of asserted themselves. And I call this particular technique the pro-Japan provocation. So these black intellectual activists, again, Marxist, you know, very class conscious, um, recognizing Japan is not, again, is an imperialist, nonetheless engaged in shaping this discourse that I call pro-Japan provocation, activating class consciousness and race consciousness strategically to advance the ends of black liberation. Du Bois is similar to in the 30s. Yeah. But Du Bois, in the case of Du Bois, uh, in the case of Du Bois, um, again, very much pro-Japan. He wrote a lot about Japan in a very sort of positive light. Um, and um, here I'm not going to go into that but in depth, but he basically I engage in kind of intellectual history here that he was elevating Japan as an agent of the movement of world history, even though, again, he recognized that Japan was no friend of darker world. And, um, but here I really kind of point out that his pro-Japan stance appears so similar to Japan's racial propaganda, specifically um, its support for pan-Asianism. So Japan engaged in the colonial projects, imperial expansion, in the name of pan-Asianism. And Du Bois sort of basically said the same thing in his writings. Here I point out sort of the limits and possibilities um, of Afro-Asian solidarity, and particularly the manner in which sort of Du Bois fell into the pitfalls of the very corrupting sort of quality of, of race. Um, anyway, um, I'm, I'm not going to go into that. This is a chapter that I think is true academic, and. I think it's not accessible. <laughs> um, anyway, um, but I, what I wanted to point out is that his demand for criticism just did not acquire the kind of critical purchase, kind of resonance that the black intellectual activists of in the immediate aftermath of the First World War had. It just it was a different time, is what I'm trying to get at. So pro Japan, the pro Japan provo provocation did not carry when Du Bois was engaging in that kind of battle. And the second half, so the, now shift to Japan and Okinawa, and this is the part that's really kind of still annoying for me, and I'm very much kind of um, engaged with it. Um, but the third chapter is about Japanese intellectuals entry into black studies, the black studies movement. And what just surprised me above all else was that 
Japanese intellectuals started and built black studies in 1954. 1954, this is well before black studies came on to higher ed as an official entity, academic unit. What happened? How did they do this? Um, and then, so I traced the curious grounding of Japan's black studies in two things, Esperanto and the Communist Party. So people who started Japan black studies in 1954, immediately after uh, the Brown versus um, Brown decision, um, were um, during the pre-war period, during the Japanese imperial sort of time, um, were very much on the left, but suppressed by the government. And one of the leaders was a, one of the leaders was a, a key member of the et local Esperanto movement. I knew nothing about Esperanto. Do you know? <laughs> it's this invented, invented universal language movement. The movement to create a universal language other than English. And this man named Yukina was a student of Esperanto. His father was actually a teacher. He's based in Kyoto. And um, he, um, he's always wanted to he was drawn to black studies because of his association with the Japanese Communist Party. And during the occupation period, the U.S. occupation period, so this is the immediate post-surrender period from 45 to 52. Of course, the U.S. occupation authority surveilled and censored a lot of materials. But of course, you can always find loopholes and places like an oasis where you find radical literature. So he found his used bookstores. Um, in his bookstore in Kyoto, where they carried a lot of Communist Party literature, so international, you know, the publishing company, um, political affairs. And a lot of these magazines covered the importance of black liberation, the Communist Party literature. Black liberation as a sort of, um, you know, flashpoint of the struggles against the empire and, and world capitalism and, and monopoly capitalism and so forth. And, and he, for that reason, he wanted to bring black studies to Japan, in part because Japan was under U.S. occupation empire. He did not see U.S. occupation as, as a, like many leftists didn't, as, as a sort of a, a road to democratization. They saw themselves, many of them, the left, on the left, saw themselves as an occupied people by U.S. empire. So the Black Studies gave them the necessary language and conceptual frameworks with, with, with which to kind of reckon with their status under U.S. occupation. But anyway, so I trace this kind of curious origin of Japan's Black Studies um, in both Esperanto and Japanese Communist Party. Um, and then the last chapter, so, so just to mention, some of you may know some of these figures, but these Japanese, I mean, so this organization is still around. Um, but their, their major sort of engagement, even to this day, is translation. So they translate these radical texts um, into Japanese and introduce them to, to Japanese readership. Um, now they translate a lot of um, Japanese, African American literature. Um, what's interesting, again, is, is the way in which they kind of mistranslation appeared in, in a lot of their texts. As some of you may know, um, NAACP, right? Um, they didn't know how to produce, pronounce NAACP, which would crop up, the word would crop up in some of the black literature. They didn't know how to pronounce it. So they used to, they pronounced it as, as a NASP. <laughs> That's derived from WASP. <laughs> but what, What's interesting about this is that they acquired knowledge about NAACP not, not from, again, sort of a very mainstream African-American literature, but literature written by the black left. So the black writers of the left were publishing here in the United States, but through the channel of the Jap you know, Communist Party network, they were able to obtain black left literature. And they're just devouring these books and NAACP will come up 
but they didn't know what it was. But they knew that it, Du Bois had something to do with NASP. <laughs> <laughs> so they're presenters. And there's a woman, a Japanese woman that I, I actually got to know quite well, who, who found herself in, in the nerve center of black radicalism in the 1950s. And some of you may know Robert Williams. Do you guys know Robert Williams? So he's a phenomenal black militant um, from Monroe, North Carolina. And he was a chapter president in Monroe of the NAACP. But in the face of repeated campaigns of white terror, he and his fellow colleagues in the, in the NAACP local chapter picked up guns to fight against the white terrorism. And of course, that just didn't sit well with the sort of general direction of NAACP. It's all about integration, now violence. So it became a sort of a national story. <coughs> but the Japanese woman becomes a very, very, very close friend of Robert Williams. And she essentially brought all the knowledge of what was happening in Monroe, North Carolina. Eventually, he was Robert Williams and his wife and his children were all forced into exile, political exile, first in Cuba. So Fidel Castro created a shelter for, for the family, Williams family. Later, Mao's China, Williams goes to Mao's China. And eventually they returned in 68, and then he basically lionized as this kind of figure in the Black Power movement and, and symbol of Afro-Asia. Um, but anyway, Nakajima is the woman, Japanese woman, that she sort of stayed close to Robert Williams for until his death. And, but she was the one who played a very, very big role in showing black Japanese intellectuals the world beyond Dr. King, the world beyond nonviolent struggles, um, this very internationalist strain. So those are the four chapters um, that make up the book. And, um, like I said, Afro-Asia is this concept that I use, and it's really made up of these diverse currents of resistance that are anti-imperialist, anti-colonial, anti-war, and anti-racist. And I regard this, these sort of, net, sort of coming together of different currents of resistance uh, as, a, as a culture of liberation. And this is a coin, a notion derived from very important black radical scholar Cedric Robinson. And um, I regard this culture of liberation as a sort of, again, like, it's like a house, but not the house, the dominance, the house built by the dominance sort of ideology, but house built by different set of values. And Dr. King, um, in opposition to the Vietnam War in, in 67, he says that if you want to be on the right side of history, and confront head on the giant, what he called the giant triplets of racism, militarism, and materialism. If you want to be on the right side of world history, not the wrong side, which is to perpetuate the giant triplets of racism, militarism, materialism, one has to go through a radical, radical revolution of values, basically kind of like a paradigm shift. And I, as I track these intellectuals, I realize that, again, they these constituents of social movements that forged Afro-Asian solidarity in different times and space really kind of cultivated this culture of liberation. And once they enter into this culture of liberation, and this is my thesis, but race, they enter into it with an really acute sense of, uh, acute race consciousness. But they enter into it uh, not by looking at race as a matter, and this is what we always do, still do, race as a matter of, of personal identity and injury. Race had nothing to do with skin color for those who entered into this domain, the culture of liberation, to force Afro-Asian solidarity. And nothing to do with skin color, but everything to do with politics and power. And they sharpen this type of commitment to do all that they can to deliver, deliver new, new visions of society, but actually try to create a new society, like through practice. So I regard Japanese, um, oh, I forgot to mention, I'm sorry, I didn't talk about the last chapter, and I should. 
chapter four. That, the chapter four, I'm so sorry. So that the people who entered in um, appear in chapter four are really, for me, great representatives of these activists and intellectual who recognize that the race had nothing to do with personal identity or injury. And had nothing to do with skin color, but everything to do with, again, politics and power, that identifications and affiliations that emerged out of concrete engagements of building relationships and movement. The last chapter is about the Vietnam War, that specifically centered in Okinawa. And some of you may know or may not know, but Okinawa is a very, very, very distinct place. And it's in the southernmost region of Japan. It used to once had once was uh, was a uh, independent kingdom, much like Hawaii, for centuries. And Japan colonized Okinawa and brought J Okinawa into Japanese imperial state. After the war, U.S. entered. You, there was a huge battle, the Battle of Okinawa, and like two one third of the population died in the war. Not just by through bombing and sort of a plunder. But Japanese imperial officers coerced Okinawans who were hiding in the caves to commit mass suicide. So one third of the population died during the Battle of Okinawa. After that, U.S. came in and occupied it. from 45 to 1972. At the end of the occupation era, Okinawa started to rally around this movement, rally around this idea of returning to Japan. But anyway, it coincided with the Vietnam War. So there's this huge, huge sort of upsurge of anti-war movement, anti-imperialist movement in Okinawa. And I tracked this, these just small pockets, small pockets of um, a movement building in Okinawa between black GIs and Okinawans. So black and white GIs who are dissenting the war and struggling within the military. Uh, Japanese pacifists who came to went to Okinawa to engage in the struggles against empire. American pacifists who entered into Okinawa to engage in the struggles against empire and militarism. So I tracked these, these individuals. And what I discovered really by looking at them is again, is that they really did not, they, it was, their engagement with their struggle, everything about it was racial. But again, they did not approach it in terms of identity politics. And I, I think that's, that's very important, like the argument that I'm presenting. Race has nothing to do with skin color, how you look, even though we want to. We still want to define it as such. But race had everything to do, again, with politics and power, and a commitment with which one creates um, a movement to, to, um, to usher in a new society. So that's, that's my argument. And Grace Lee Boggs, I don't know if you guys know Grace Lee Boggs, it's a great Chinese-American activist and philosopher and Marxist. And I was reading, rereading her um, autobiography, Living for Change. And there's this moment where she got a PhD from Brimmore in philosophy. She's brilliant, so smart. Because she's women and she's Chinese, she can't get a job, like academic job. You know, just to, systematic discrimination. So she ends up at the University of Chicago working in a library. But she quickly enters into between political space and political struggle. And specifically when in one of the parks in I think the South Side, she saw these ordinary people, you know, suddenly getting really excited about um, March on Washington movement. And this March on Washington movement, this is not 1963 March on Washington, but Actually, A. Philip Randolph was a capitalist in creating this movement, the mass movement to bring all black folks from all over the country to march in Washington, D.C. to demand desegregation. Desegregation in defense industries and desegregation in the military. And it scared Franklin Roosevelt when he issued executive order to desegregate the industry, but not the military. The Federal, Federal Employment Practice Commission, FEPC, right? But anyway, so Gracie Pox saw like ordinary people just getting so in excited and enthralled by this idea of marching, marching to, to D.C., the mass movement, to be the participant. And this idea that this movement could usher in, bring in something entirely different, that sense of hope. But actually these are activists who are actually rehearsing the future as those already here in the present. And that, she, she called it futuring. That 
made her want to dedicate her entire life in a struggle for black liberation. And that's what she did. And that's 1943 or something like that when Grace Lee Boggs had this kind of moment of rupture. And again, that had nothing to do her identification as Chinese American, woman, Asian American, identification black liberation, nothing to do with color. Everything to do with politics and power that allowed her to shape her commitment to do all that she can to deliver a new society. So I think, oh my God. So that's it, that's the gist of the book. <laughs> but I want to read you the conclusion of the book and maybe just, it is a little bit academic, but I want to see if I can get to it. Some of the summaries will pop up. So it's called We Who Become Together. I think its conclusion is, um, I decided to write about my own teaching experience. And I, I really wasn't going to publish, turn my dissertation into a book. After I finished, I thought I was done, and I had a job teaching at Borough Manhattan Community College in the city of New York in the CUNY system. But I was teaching black studies as an Asian American person in the black studies spaces. And, but anyway, so this, this particular chapter kind of gets at this stuff. But it starts with Toni Morrison. So Toni Morrison's meditation on the writer's craft can be read as a serious cha challenge. Morrison explains, I have wanted always to develop a way of writing that was irrevocably black. I don't have the resources of musician, but I thought that if it was truly black literature, it would not be black because I was. It would not be even be black because of its subject matter. It would be something intrinsic, indigenous, something in a way it was put together. The sentences, the structure, texture, and tone, something that was put together, so that's assembly. It's, to me, it's like I read it as solidarity. So that anyone who read it would realize it. So her effort to enunciate blackness, its infinite variety and complexity in language without being overcome by the corruption of race, is intended to be paradigmatic. And it is to this bold call for reworking that has helped chart in this book the analysis of variations of trans-Pacific strivings in Black America, Japan, and Okinawa. The work of animating Afro-Asian solidarity mirrors the challenge of creating art that Toni Morrison describes. Following Morrison's insight, this book has argued that um, diverse participants of Afro-Asian solidarity projects in Black America, Japan, and Okinawa in the 20th century found ways to link up through imagination and social practice. And this process of identification was irrevocably racial. Yet it had little to do with the color of participants of Afro-Asian solidarities, nor did it have to do with how black and white American, Japanese, and Okinawan intellectual activists tapped into the tradition of historical black struggles, although that was one of the essential vectors that quickened the trans-Pacific currents of resistance. The, low, the low, low side of their struggles appeared in opposition to war, militarism, imperialism, and colonialism. And the texture of these struggles was characterized by a variety, variety of acts of coming together. It followed both familiar and unlikely routes, from Marxism to Esperanto and pacifism. It also took forms that brought together seeming opposite, black intellectual activists with Marxist groundings, for instance, saw symbolic significance of Japan's race conscious defiance within the international system of competitive nation states and took a pro Japan position, although they were keenly aware of, of Japan's role in Asia. So, anyway, I kind of describe this kind of way in which this Tony Morrison's call to, to articulate race without being subsumed or overcome by by race as, as a sort of biological character. And I came to realize that when I was teaching, and I'm not going to read it, but um, at BMCC, Borough Manhattan Community, so as you can imagine, Borough Manhattan Community College is a really dynamic space. It's in the inner city, lower Manhattan, right above Tribeca, or in Tribeca. Um, students come from all four boroughs. They're immigrants, migrants, 
mm. just all over the world. And they come to black studies courses. And these are African migrants, peoples of African descent, people from the Caribbean, African Americans from Harlem, Bronx, Brooklyn. And you see Asian person teaching African civilization. <laughs> you see Asian person teaching African American history. And some of these black students are even just phenomenal scholars. They're self-taught. They, they've acquired knowledge outside of the public education system. And some of them, you could just call them Afrocentrists, but they're not. You could just, you know, just sort of brush them aside as a black cultural nationalist. Well, they're not. They're sitting in front of me, and they're pissed. <laughs> because I'm teaching, not black person. So, other people are curious. You know, but so they're paying attention because they're curious. So I'll talk about, let's say, you know, oppression, of course. The system of oppression. Structures of oppression through history. And these black cultural nationalists will say, no, professor, you got it all wrong. I'm like, well, let me hear, you're right, let me hear. My story is always incomplete. <laughs> let me hear, we fought that. You see, we were resilient, we survived, we're here. And I say, you're right. So the next session, I talk about agency, right? It's just, just a relentless quest for freedom through history and their creativity and innovation, uh, militancy. And again, they'll stop me and say, no, Professor, you got it all wrong. You don't understand the unspeakable scale of violence visited upon us. You don't get it. So we went back and forth like this. So this basically what I'm trying to get at is the race is really dialectical. Again, it's not skin color. It's a concept. It's a political category of struggle, you see. So these students got it, and I got it, or even, though, even though I didn't know. Although they entered into the class with a very sort of, you know, 19th century understanding of race. Race for them was black, how you look. But along the way, in this class, when we, how we engaged, they changed, I changed. But it's that kind of a movement through race. And initially I wanted to call this book Moving in a Racial Groove, like a music groove, racial groove. The publisher didn't like it. <laughs> Even though what I wanted to do more than anything else was to just as just as Morrison was trying to say, I wanted to capture that quality. I don't have the resources of musician as Tony Morrison said, but she has the capacity as a writer to put together words and sentences to create a certain kind of tone, texture that allow the reader to think of what she's writing is, is very much black, but it has nothing to do with the fact that she's black. But it's, it's in the way things are put together that makes it black. And I really felt that when I was teaching that we were creating Afro-Asian solidarity. Even though these students came with different perspectives, different historical experiences and perspectives, we moved in racial groove and forged racial solidarity. And again, these students came from all over the world. And I, at that moment when I realized, like, oh, I think that's my thesis statement for my book. <laughs> but I never, I never thought to finish. <laughs> and then I thought, maybe I can go back to the chapters that I wrote and then kind of refine it and, and, and calibrate them. And that's, so that's how the book kind of started. And, um, and I was going to talk about the contemporary challenge of afro and where I might find it. Um, um, I think I think it's everywhere. Um, and one episode or anecdote, and many of you may have seen this because Asian American stuff. Um, in the wake of all the extra judicial killings, police brutality, Mike Brown and beyond, Ferguson and beyond, um, Asian Americans, um, of course, started to show their solidarity with Black Lives Matter. But there's this one form of Afro-Asian solidarity that put me like a, a bit, put me in this kind of uneasy kind of position, and it had to do with this was a letter, open letter, crowdsourcing letter campaign. I don't know if you guys remember this, but a group of Asian Americans decided to write a letter, open letter to their family members, mothers and dads and uncles, and, and this particularly came out of the Peter Lin is the Chinese American cop police officer in New York City who killed, her name is Akai Gurley. Um, 
again, unarmed black men shot and killed by a police officer, but this police officer, a Chinese American police officer, and he was on trial, and he was essentially, unlike other police officers who were acquitted, were, was not acquitted. So these Chinese Americans in New York City basically kind of started a movement to defend POV, defend the police. And some of the young Asian Americans, I think, felt very, very uncomfortable, right? kind of disquieting at that. And to respond to that, they wrote this open letter. It's a crowdsourcing kind of mechanism. So they wrote this open letter and sort of sent through social media. And thousands and thousands of people kind of signed on or read it or even translated it in multiple languages, like 20 plus languages. And it became a sort of an expression of Afro-Asian solidarity. And the contents of the letter is that it's directed at the mothers and fathers and uncles and aunts and pointing out their anti-blackness, anti blackness, essentially. Why can't you get it? You know, why, why can't you show some empathy toward black lives? So it's just kind of a plea, but it it's also can be read as a very condescending, um, as though these Asian immigrants or refugees, particularly immigrants and refugees from Southeast Asia, as though they've never experienced state violence, as though they never threw the horrors of war. <clears throat> so these young people writing letters, telling their parents, like, well, stop being racist. <laughs> And that shallowness of, of that appeal kind of put me at, at ease and, and wonder what, what it might look like in Afro Asian solidarity in the age of, let's say, Black Lives Matter. And I, I had a student who was part of Asian Americans for Black Lives here locally. And I was never part of the group, but I saw and I even talked to him. And um, I think it was during the state fair time. But the activists kind of decided to disrupt, took direct action during the state fair time uh, in Minnesota to make known, you know, the demands and, that are issued by Black Lives Matter. And there's one student, an undocumented student, Asian American, Philippine. So he said, I'm for Black Lives Matter, you know, because I'm undocumented, I'm struggling against the, I'm against deportation regime. Because I'm documented Filipino. And that's just like completely for me like conversation changing. You know. It's not this kind of stale, shallow appeal of Afro-Asian solidarity that the young Asian American activists kind of circulate. And it's, I think it's in those moments where I find relevance and resonance of Afro-Asian solidarity. Um, sometimes those utterances alone that he issued at the rally. I, for me, when I heard it, like, I'm like, wow, you know, that's just, that changes everything. That's the radical revolution of values that I think is so critical to the making of Afro-Asian solidarity. So I'll end there, and um, maybe ask, take some more questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, yeah, I really feel like sometimes that even this concept of Afro-Asian solidarity is useful, but at the same time, it's kind of limiting. Um, so when you track a symbolic, iconic kind of figure like Yuri Kochiyama, Yuri Kochiyama was a phenomenal Japanese-American activist, um, lived in Harlem. Um, her husband, Bill, was a veteran of, of, the, of the war. Japanese American segregated unit, con you know, sent to concentration camps, and pulled out of camps to fight in a war to prove their loyalty. But anyway, so Yuri Kochiyama became very much embedded and enmeshed in black struggles for liberation, 
but specifically they became very close to um, Malcolm X. But if you track her um, life in like in totality, she she goes well beyond Afro Asian solidarity. So I, I, I think it's it's very important. Um, I mean, oh, for us, entry point is always those iconic figures, and um, so she would find herself in these spaces that are sort of very much all Asian Americans. So Asian Americans for Action, it's triple A, started in West Coast, but also traveled to New York City, and she was new to this space, the very Asian, radical Asian American space, because she basically cut her, so that she went through experience within the black liberation struggle. And this is in 69, 1970. So she's like, you know, entering into different domains of struggles and communities of struggle. And maybe some, there's something about Afro-Asian solidarity that, that teaches individuals and activists to move through movement spaces in a more supple way. Once they begin to build solidarity across differences, they begin to realize that the techniques and approaches and sensitivities with which you relate to people and build sort of commitment in movement state, space it can be transferred or can be translated in other spaces. So, I, th I mean, I really am not so embedded in, in sort of concrete Afro-Asian sort of solidarity locally or anything like that. But I do find that a lot of people who were cognizant, like Asian Americans, were cognizant to black liberation, its history and its politics. I think found find themselves in a very sort of a, you know, find themselves in a, a multiracial movement spaces, regardless of the causes or the ends of the struggles, and they can move through the politics of identification, be able to relate, be able to shape the politics. And, but there's something about the experience of engaging in Afro-Asian solidarity allows for that, I think, suppleness, suppleness with which one participates in movement space. So, I know it's kind of vague, but... <laughs> hey. Oh, I'm still thinking. There's one question. Oh, okay. Uh, I guess I'm curious, uh, uh, since like I think your it seems like your book mainly focuses on like um, like Black American and Japanese Okinawan like uh, solidarity yeah. or like dialogue discourse yeah. like I wonder like how you decided to call it like Afro Asian since Asia is so huge <laughs> yeah. right um, well the concept of Afro Asia it has been around through history, so it's not something that sort of cropped up like in the 20th century, like, you know, like the, um, in the context of Black Power movement or anything like that. Afro-Asia, their connections, like Du Bois, for instance, have, have always um, kind of looked to the Afro-Asia, the coming unity between, let's say, China and, and in Africa um, as a basically wellspring of, of inspiration and imagination. And, um, and a lot of writers and intellectuals in India too and have also looked to sort of a Black America or Pan Africa as a source of inspiration to imagine a world beyond, beyond Eurocentrism. And um, so that concept has always been sort of an integral to that kind of intellectual movement, Afro-Asia. Um, so, and I think that's why I turned to it. And Du Bois, Du Bois has always been my kind of source of guide. Uh, it's a sort of an important guide for me that he wrote this very interesting book called Dark Princess in 1928, published it. He saw it, he regards it as it's one of his favorite works that he published in his lifetime. There are many, many things that he wrote and published, but he regards Black Princess, Dark Princess as his favorite. But, and it's a coming unity between Black men and Indian women, the women from India, and their marriage. And that symbolizes sort of, sort of the world beyond 
Eurocentrism, and it's published in 28. And so, you know, it's that type of uh, context that I was sort of thinking about. Um, but, um, and also, I, I guess I turned to Afro-Asia because when I was working on it, um, there are a lot of books that have come up about Afro-Asia. So, Vijay Prashad, mm -hmm. um, you know, Fred, Fred Ho has the book in many of our collections here. Worked with Bill Moore to publish this anthology called Afro-Asia. Robin D.G. Kelly uh, wrote important essay with Elizabeth, Elizabeth S. called Black Like Mao, looking at the connection between black radicals in Mao's China. And there's some stuff that BJ has written about, Prashad has written about the Bandang too, there's this kind of a, the, the efforts on the part of not just the activists, but actually political leaders trying to create the world beyond the binary contestation of the Cold War. And it's called a non-alignment movement. And um, I'm trying to imagine sort of the advancement of the darker world outside of inter-imperial bribery between the U.S. and the Soviet. And some of these countries, the nation states are former, you know, formerly colonized peoples. So I think that's why I also turned to Afro-Asia as, as an appellation with which to think about. Um, and I know it's broad, but, so I wanted to apply that um, notion to a very specific place. Hey, hey uh, so as you said, race isn't about skin color, melon, as much as it is about power, uh, to get to the roots of it. And you know, you think about indigeneity or ownership of land, or one's relationship to land as um, a site of contention around power, as well as capitalism with currency. And I think, you know, one, one last thing before I actually get into it, I think, um, like Asian Americanness, like the Americanness I've decided for something is Asians' relationship to blackness, whiteness, or indigeneity. And I think, like, the, I got to get to a question. Um, Asians have a longing, want to like belong to this country that they're at, right? And one way is like to assimilate to one group or another. And I think blackness is one space to occupy for, for belonging. Um, and I wonder about that in terms of like, oh, it's like kind of splashy to be Afro-Asian versus like Afro-Indigenous, like being uh, I don't know, or Afro working class, or Asian working class, like being being vocal about your solidarity with the working class, because you know, blackness. I gotta get to a question, man. <laughs> <laughs> I've been thinking about a lot of this stuff, right? I, uh, so, so. Uh, 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 Go ahead and please. <laughs> How do you yeah, talk about all this stuff coherently? How do you talk about this with others coherently, I guess? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's a very, I mean, difficult um, thing. Like, indige indigenous struggles, you know, indigenous people's ties to land, and racism, and white supremacy, the structures of oppression seem to, structures of oppression are so multiple and manifold. And, and, like just this past uh, December, I, I went back to Okinawa and um, to be with my friends and colleagues. And, and my colleague, her name is um, Eriko Ikeha, who's PhD from Ethnic Studies at Berkeley. She's black Okinawa. And uh, it's really complicated, but anyway, the basis in Okinawa from 45 to 72 hyper segregated, so the black GI town, white GI town. The space is very, the township is very enclave, it's very small, you know, just like a couple blocks in this neighborhood. She was raised in a black GI district called Teruya. And uh, I, I wrote it, I mean, I write about it in the book. And that's how we got to know each other. And, uh, and she's black Okinawan, very much engaged in anti-base struggles. Uh, 
anti-militarism, anti-imperialism. And she, she, of course, sees herself as Okinawa mixed. She sees us as well as black, she's mixed. She's in women, she speaks Japanese. And she doesn't really, she's beyond category in so many different ways. And she was telling me, and this I'm sure is prevalent too in indigenous struggles, but there's sort of small but strong um, indigenous struggles, but Okinawan struggle for independence today is sort of dovetailing around struggles against basis and militarism. It's small. And she was telling me the story that because she's black, um, she, she's, she's not sort of validated, validated within the indigenous struggles in Okinawa. Uh, I'm not saying that they're playing this idea of left quantum, like how much blood you have, which, which of course ensues in indigenous communities. And so she was telling me about the, sort of the complexities of it all. And, and so, what, what do we do with that? Um, how do we make sense of that? And I mean, I'm a firm believer in, in, in doing small things. <laughs> So the people that I write about are just such a small group of people, 20, 25 people. Like, you can count them. But I take them seriously. What they, what they did, what, what, what they wrote, what they said. Um, and so I, I, th I think small small group of people, I, I think, can do a, a lot of like pretty amazing things. It may not change the world, but it, it, it sure can transform relations of power um, at the local level. And I, I feel like, you know, she, she was telling me all the way that she's struggling. But at the same time, she's constantly going to these places, the valleys and meetings and people. And antagonism is there and contentions are there. But she's always looking, I think, for contingencies, sort of unpredictable things that can happen certain kind of creativity that happens in unlikely way, in unexpected ways, in those pace spaces and moments. And I think those are the moments that she's like looking for, um, sort of chance encounters. It's like one of the things that she's so, so obsessed with chance encounters. And he, she thinks that the chance en encounters can really, really, really break through a lot of the norms with which we operate. And um, just like my teaching experience, like that unexpected, like, what the heck is he, what is, what's he doing in black studies? You know, that's so unlikely. But that, that unlikely spaces um, offer creative opportunities to really dismantle norms. Norms that are just so deadly, I think. And uh, norms around not just race, but other categories. Um, yeah. Um. I was born in Okinawa, okay. and uh, so I went, uh, I went to uh, the military, U.S. military dependent school mm -hmm. all my life, so kind of mixed up, you know, but, but, uh, but I have a number of friends who are, you know, black, black, black Okinawan, mm -hmm. uh, and, and actually that's a pretty diverse group of people in and of itself, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they live that life, but they don't study it. They don't intellectualize right, it. Right, right. And so I, I just kind of wonder, you know, as you look through all this, mm -hmm. what would you tell them? You know, what would you, what you like them to know? Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm going back to Eriko again. So Eriko went back to Okinawa after getting PhD. Went back to this town that she grew up in. Again, very small enclave. There's no semblance of blackness in this. It's in Koza, which is Okinawa city, right next to the Air Force Base called Kadena. Their history is erased, <coughs> completely erased. There's no semblance. But she has memories, she has pictures, she has these little pamphlets that are there. So she's creating a resource center, much like here, Eastside Freedom Library, called Koza Mixtopia. And she's waiting for those chance encounters, people to come in. But she's also done these kind of interesting kind of projects where she would invite people who used to live there. So many of them Okinawan women who worked in bars and brothels and other establishments. 
and her mother was, of course, the resident. Um, and she would take them on a tour of the enclave and collect the memories. And she's basically mapping the space. And, um, and um, sort of collecting, so she's creating this kind of map, cartography of a blackness in Okinawa. And I think that those stories have to, need to be told. Um, they're their history. Just as, you know, history is very much sort of a politics and groups are excluded. History is written in a triumphant way, in a self-serving way. Master narrative is always domineering and crippling and damaging. And I think she's interested in writing against that kind of master narrative. And those tales of how, I don't know, let's say, black women in a barbershop, the black barbershop, black women cutting black GI, male GIs. There are pictures of that. And as you know, the barbershop is a very generous space in the black community. You know. But there's a picture of black and Okinawan men stylizing this man's black hair, the Afro kind of hair. And again, again, that those, again, you can, you, you can, you don't know the background, the stories or anecdotes, but that particular picture reveals so much about the intimacies of their lives. So I'd like to tell these black Okinawans that you had a world that you had never known. Uh, maybe your relatives were connected to it. Maybe your distant, distant ancestors were part of this, especially the young ones. But that's the world that I get born, that Robin Kelly's, the cognitive maps of the future. The social movements produce cognitive maps of the future, the world not yet born. I'm so interested in that. And I think people should, should know more about that. Yeah. So, I think if, at first I was concerned that as you laid out the origins of movements, anti-war, anti-imperialism, anti-racism, that I was concerned to what degree can people come together only around what they're against. And, and I wonder if the way that you've responded to MINA and, and talked about Afro-Asian solidarity in a sense, not as an end point, but as the, the process that Grace Lee Boggs experienced, that Yuri Kochiyama experienced, that others in the, that Fred Ho very much experienced, that others in the movement begin to experience maybe what there are prefiguring moments of in that barber shop. Of, of people living in ways that cut against the dominant narratives and the norms of, of, of how people are, are supposed to live. So, um, like the young brother over here, I'm not sure what my question is, but, um, but, I, but I think, and, and I think you want to think and you want us to think dialectically rather than linear. So it isn't just, oh, people come together and then they get new ideas and then they become new human beings. And, and yet somehow in all of that, there is a transformative process. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's where, for me, the work that you've done historically is useful to what we're trying to do now. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, maybe the question is, would you say a little bit about what you're working on now, oh, and yeah. how that continues these questions. Well, I'll, I'll say it. Uh, now I'm not doing anything because I am so inundated with administrative work. <laughs> 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 That's the truth. Um, <laughs> um, what am I doing? Um, many small things that I'm doing. Um, well, let's see. What am I doing? What about Abby Lincoln? Oh, that kind of stuff. What about Okinawa hip hop in Hawaii? Sure. <laughs> um, sure. Those. I'm. Uh, I'm. 
I have these mini projects, small projects, um, one of which is right, Okinawan hip hop scenes. And they're quite vibrant and um, they're very creative people. So they're, of course, hip hop is very much associated with blackness. And, and oftentimes the hip hop, that domain becomes a very space with which to commodify blackness or fetishize blackness. But I'm trying to sort of show that they actually sort of veer away from all of that trappings. And, um, so I'm looking into that kind of stuff. And <laughs> um, this is a historical work that I don't think I'll ever finish, but I'm interested in the genesis of o occupied Okinawa, where that came from. And it's very, very complicated. But Okinawa, so when the United States came and occupied Okinawa, and this is 45 at the end of the war, and a peace treaty was signed in 1951 with Japan and the US. And those two empires decided to detach Okinawa from Japan and put it under the sort of absolute authority of the United States, the military. But the United States did not want to create, as one of the diplomats said, another Puerto Rico. So they had to come up with the new legal technology with which to occupy Okinawa indefinitely. So you might know this man named John Foster Dulles. Yeah. Secretary of State, I believe, under Eisenhower. But he was one of the diplomats and legal architects of the peace treaty, specifically Okinawa. So he came up with this legal category called residual sovereignty, not full sovereignty, but residual sovereignty, and made an argument that Japan, even though Okinawa is not part of Japan, it's going to be under US authority. Japan would have residual sovereignty, not full sovereignty, over Okinawa. And meanwhile, the United States would consider putting Okinawa under UN trusteeship and deliberate what to do with conquered territory. U.S. had no intention of trying to figure out what to do. U.S. had every intention of staying there, keeping the basis, but above all else, making Okinawa into a, a liminal, very liminal status with very ambiguous territorial arrangement. Much like Guantanamo, creating this legal black hole with which an imperial state would do whatever it wanted to do without following legal you know, protocols like international conventions, whatever. So this particular concept called the residual sovereignty was invented by were not invented, but used by John Foster Jones. And I want to understand the genesis of this. And I'm trying to understand the genesis of it by looking into John Foster Dulles's life. So John Foster Dulles was a legal lawyer, attorney. I forgot the name, I should know the law firm. The law firm that represented just a ton of multinational corporations in the 1910s and 20s, based in this, of course, firms based in New York. Firms like probably Ford, other big multinational corporations that were going into Latin America and just seizing massive, massive territory to, to basically expropriate raw materials and build factories or expropriate raw materials without colonizing these countries like Brazil. You know, some Central American countries. <coughs> and he came, Panama Canal is another space that he was very much involved in. Um, so how do you create spaces that are completely in, 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 under US sort of imperial control, but not part of the United States at all, so that you can exclude the inhabitants of those territories, that they were not entering into the, into the US, US, US as a citizens, nor immigrants. They did this with Filipinos, <coughs> to colonize Philip Puerto Rico. They invented this legal category called the U.S. national. They're neither citizens nor immigrants, aliens. They're U.S. nationals. Only right they possess is that they could go anywhere within U.S. imperial territorial jurisdiction without passport. 
So Filipinos were neither citizens nor aliens, U.S. nationals. Anyway, I think Okinawa's genesis of Okinawa, the occupied architecture of American occupation in Okinawa, has roots in these imperial plunder adventures across Western Hemisphere, particularly that's where Foster Dulles was very much engaged in. And he actually was a very much an advocate of Hitler throughout the 20s and 30s, John Foster Dulles. He burned all the records associated with it. And it's in this book called Overthrown. That's where I discovered something about regime change, how these basically attorneys and technocrats and people like that engage in regime change across the world. And I'm like reading about this and seeing John Foster Dulles, and I've read something about John Foster Dulles in Okinawa. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is where it all came from. But it's, it's a mechanism of imperial domination without colonizing. And you could call it neocolonialism, but neocolonialism, I thought, it came after colonialism instead. But what's so striking about Okinawa is that in an age of decolonization, the United States was engaging in colonialism in Okinawa. How do you make sense of that? So that's what I'm grappling with. That's the project that I'll never, never be able to finish. <laughs> Um, I guess I was wondering how you see your thesis kind of um, how or if it relates to kind of like the broader issues of like colorism and if, because in some ways it could be seen as kind of like just setting that aside mm -hmm. completely. Right. And I don't know, does that, does setting that aside have impacts on what kind of solidarity can exist or like yeah, how you think about that? Yeah. Um, you know, whenever one engages in social struggles against oppression, I mean, ultimately, it starts, I mean, it, it always does start with harms done to the oppressed, harm, the injury. And, uh, I think Robin Kelly had this really, really great essay called Black Study, Black Struggle, which was published in Boston Review. And they expressed this kind of reservation toward the use of, ubiquitous use of trauma in the spaces of struggle. Trauma. I'm traumatized by the system of oppression. I'm traumatized by institutional violence. Trauma. But that word has a kind of way of simplifying the experience of the people who are under duress and oppression and kind of reduce it to the level of, again, kind of harm, personal harm or injury. And, and often times of identity politics, you know, identity politics oftentimes has become this sort of a, a vector or some sort of a flashpoint with which people shape insurgent politics. And, but I, I feel and I agree with um, Robin Kelly or others too that are kind of starting to show some sort of um, not contempt but reservation, uneasiness toward um, our investment in identity politics as a starting point in building the movement. Um, there's this interesting book that just came out um, Hyder, I forgot his first name, Mistaken Identity. This is his little book. And he goes after identity politics as a, as a basically um, that neutralizes radical movements and radical movement um, And I, I kind of agree with him. Um, so that's, that's where I was kind of trying to think about too in my work. So then, what, what do you, what do you, what, what would you rally around, you know, if not this sort of identity issue? Um, and again, I guess Peter was saying Afro-Asian solidarity was sort of like a starting point for them to kind of get through some of the messiness and challenges and differences and tensions, and to sort of find a new way um, of of shaping the movement however short-lived. Um, um, 
But identity politics, that book, Mistaken Identity, I, I recommend it. It's kind of interesting. I, I like it because it, it doesn't just say oh, identity politics is bad, but it, it actually tracks this very strange career of the concept of identity politics. So when you read it, it's kind of cool. Identity politics, actually black, lesbian, queer, feminist, socialist group called Kambahi River Collective, and some of you may know, was the one that who actually first coined identity politics. And this is a group that's actually engaging in concrete struggles against the state and imperialism and empire and patriarchy, heteropatriarchy, and all the normativities that are sort of terrible. And they're the ones who coined identity politics. But their, 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 that, their prize was not like liberating yourself from trauma. <laughs> you know, they were looking at, their prize was going after that bigger structure. So what's interesting about this book is that it kind of tracks this strange career. What happened? Like it started with Kambahi Riro Collector and their notion of identity politics. And now it's sort of reduced to this kind of very sort of stale, shallow understanding of identity politics. And that's for me is the most important and most compelling part of that book is that like strangeness what happened. Um, but anyway. What is the book called? Mistaken Identity. It's a little book published by Burchell. Um, I think a lot of, a lot of these uh, progressives are reading it because they are starting to realize that identity politics actually kind of gets in a way of their efforts to build concrete struggles against the system. Whatever, however, however you define it. How do we actually go after, I don't know, empire or state power? Or, you know. yeah. Quick question. So I'm trying to wrap my head all around this. It's really interesting. So the, when you're saying Afro-Asian solidarity, where does intersectionality fit in? Is it the macro or the micro of Afro-Asian uh, mm -hmm. solidarity? How do you see that fitting in? Okay, so intersectionality in terms of like race, gender, sexuality, and things like that. Yeah. Um, oppression. Oppression, right. Um, mm -hmm, right. Um, so a lot of the stuff that I write about in the book are very much male centric. <laughs> okay, that's. <laughs> so I, I kind of kind of call into question their form of solidarity. It's very gendered. Masculines. But in the final chapter where I talk about Okinawa, I, I kind of begin to explore how this very masculine conception of black freedom that was sort of carried and performed and uh, put to work in Okinawa, it actually kind of created certain kind of bonds that, that um, transcended the gender, gender binaries and the gender violence. Um, so, for instance, it's very, it's kind of like similar to how people talk about Black Panther Party and there's a masculinized presence, but they're doing this kind of really cool on the ground, you know, community work and breakfast club, building community centers and engaging in childcare and responding to the social needs of the people and these are black plants, you know, the image is the iconic one, is the gun toting kind of militant black. But on the ground, they're doing these things that are just not the normative, the gender identities. And I, I kind of found those spaces in Okinawa. Um, so you would think that the, the spaces of prostitution, of brothel, in the, again, the black GI town or white GI town, is where you find some hyper exploitation of Okinawa women. Um, but, but then again, those are the spaces, the intimate spaces where they, they actually meet and start to build relationships. And it's very complicated. Um, so, and then some of the activists were like, basically rapping. So these are anti-war activists and pacifists and, you know, getting to know people and build a movement. And, and there are all these kind of interesting kind of, um, I found in the archive, uh, notes about what, what they're discussing. They're basically having meetings and 
rapping about their feelings and thoughts and things like that. And one of the things that they're rapping about is like a marriage. Like they're talking about marriage and how they don't believe in institutional marriage. And, and, and these are like, you know, black men and, and white pacifists and Japanese activists and Okinawans and kind of talking about their lives. And, and, and so, again, those are the kinds of spaces where I, I see the different, different ways of relating to each other. Um, you could call it intersectionality or something like that. that yeah. Good. Uh, yeah, it is about the time that we usually do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys usually leave. We stay a little long. Um, Sell some books. So, uh, a few things. Uh, as Peter mentioned, Subtext Books is here, or maybe Robin mentioned it, that Subtext Books is here. Uh, there are um, books for sale, and I'm sure you each will sign a copy for you if you buy one, which would be great. Um, also, you may have noticed there are envelopes on your chair when you came in. Um, those are contribution envelopes. If you are able and moved, we'd love if you love something in those. Um, also, I hope everyone got a chance to sign the guest book on the way in. If you didn't, make sure you do before you leave because we want to involve you in more of these conversations. Um, and thank you everyone for coming and thank you Luigi for your presentation.